Masonic service? Our Father, which art in heaven, our hearts are glad and grateful again to be together here and to share, to hear music and to share the word and to share with each other the time that have been allotted. And we pray that you would bless all that's said and done. May again we receive from your table uh, that which is nourishing for our spiritual uh, vitality and life, uh, that you may uh, call us, Lord, to wake up, to rise, to move forward. We pray for a speaker in a special way, uh, uh, Brother Floyd. We pray for him and uh, the message that he's going to bring, that you'll feed us through that, that you'll bless our hearts, that in turn we might be a blessing to others. Pray for Brother Darrell as he brings to us the message in song and that you will bless our hearts, feed us from your table also there, uh, that we might grow in grace and in knowledge. We might have that uh, uh, power in our lives that we need to live the life that you've called us to live and that you've so graciously given to us the power to walk in the way by following in your footsteps, by leading, uh, being led by your Holy Spirit, by following your word. Now again, we just ask a double portion to be poured out upon this service, for we pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Brother Darrell, come and share with us. Anytime I feel discouraged, the Lord has been helping me to gird up my mind. Anytime you feel discouraged, it's a very important thing for us to recognize that every good thought, every good gift comes from God. And the negative thoughts are coming from the enemy. One of the most encouraging thoughts that I have and if we stop and think about it, it's in John chapter 17. To think that Jesus prayed for you and me. Isn't that a wonderful thought? Yeah. Jesus prayed for you and me. Because he knew what we would be up against. He experienced it. He went through it. To show us that we too, by taking hold of the power of the Father, by the power of God, can have victorious lives here on this earth. <laughs> Right. 
righteous man's prayer avails its truth. Jesus prayed for me and you. He prayed that we His glory through us would shine from within. He'll work in us to will and to do. Take courage, my friends. He prayed for you. He prayed for me. He prayed for you. Our desperate need he already knew. A righteous man's prayer avails its truth. Jesus prayed for me and you. Jesus prayed for me and you. Good afternoon. It's good to look out and see the faces of God's people. I especially appreciate seeing Daryl. I hope you realize that his CDs are available here in the bookstore also. And uh, when I see Daryl, it brings back memories because before I actually ever, ever came with Hope International, I'd pastored in uh, Wyoming, Rocky Mountain Conference, for eight years, and my first wife passed away, and I remarried after that and left from the conference, went up into Montana, and I uh, met Daryl up in Montana way back in those, those days, and uh, he was starting to get started. With his ministry, I know that uh, Dwight Hall, who's going to be here, helped uh, promote. He knew that Daryl had some wonderful messages in his songs, and D Dwight helped pro promote Daryl. And, uh, and uh, I hope that you'll take the opportunity to get some of his other songs. He's going to be speaking today after me, I believe, and also he's going to have a concert later this afternoon. So uh, I do appreciate you, Daryl. He's a... And he's got the right theology, folks. <laughs> and that always helps, too. I, was, I traveled, actually, with Ron Spear for four years. Was at Hope International for that time. And I had been remarried for a short period of time. As I mentioned, my first wife had passed away. I remarried a young lady from Uchi Pines because I knew I needed the medical missionary <laughs> work, too. That's not the main reason, but it sure worked out well because uh, she was a supervisor there at UT, and she had quite a background in uh, the medical missionary work. And, and my first wife had gone to UT Pines for medical treatment, and that was about two time zones away from where I was. And my first wife and my present wife became good friends because my present wife was my first wife's lifestyle counselor. I'll tell you, the way the Lord works is just unbelievable. Because I never met my first wife, at, I mean my present wife at that point. And my first wife came back and uh, indicated, said some good things about her lifestyle counselor. And, you know, I didn't think much about it. After my first wife had passed away, I began to pray and ask God what I should do with my life. And... Uh, God put my present wife's name in my mind. Hadn't met her, 
had talked to her on the phone once about my first wife's treatment. And I wrote a letter asking about courtship. I remember, she's two time zones away. I've never met her personally. And I wrote, a, and I wrote this letter about courtship. And uh, I didn't send it. <laughs> I said, this is crazy. I wasn't raised in the Adventist church. I wasn't raised to really understand courtship. I came in from outside the church never knowing what a Seventh-day Adventist was. I was actually, I practiced law in the state of Colorado for 14 years and became a Seventh-day Adventist and knew at that point, because I had become a reborn Christian before that, knew that this was the right message, folks. I still know that today. Anyhow... I threw that first letter away, and I kept being impressed, right, and asked about courtship. And so I wrote again another letter, and uh, this time I sent it. And you can imagine my wife, you ladies can imagine this, a letter comes in the mail from somebody you've never met. You've known their wife for five weeks, but you've never met them. And this letter is asking you about courtship. And she had a friend with her, and you, you need to, you can't hear her side of the story because she's not here. And she took this to her friend, and she said, Patty, and by her way, her friend is the one that does, does scripture songs. My first wife is on a couple of those scripture songs because they were really good friends. Some of them, they'd sing at Uchi Pines. She said, Patty, look at this. <laughs> and then she went to Dr. Agatha Thrash because she knew she needed to get counsel. And I tell everybody, Agatha's really a good friend of mine now <laughs> because when she went to Dr. Thrash she said Dr. Thrash what do I do and Dr. Thrash led, read my letter and she said well a pastor needs a good wife <laughs> she didn't have any out and so we started courting actually by mail and of course I, I as you know I write some for the magazine I'm very prolific when I write so I was sending her letters I get a letter once in a while and finally after a while we uh, began I, I finally called her remember two time zones away I'd call her at 4 o'clock my time which would be 6 o'clock her time because at 7 she had to be at breakfast and so that went on for a while and, and finally uh, and my children I had three children and I, about that point in time, my wife had a little bit of life insurance, my first wife, and we used the money I wanted to take because it was a real shock. My children were still, you know, uh, in college age. We went to Europe, and I hadn't told them about this courtship by mail. And I was sneaking to the mailbox in Europe and dropping these letters. <laughs> Later, my son said, I saw you doing that, Dad. But uh, you always wonder, how are your children going to react? But you know your children. And so I went to my uh, middle, middle child, who's a daughter, because I knew that's, <laughs> you know who to go to first. And I, I told her that I was involved in courtship, and, and uh, she needed to know about that. And she uh, said, hey, that's great, Dad. I'm all for it. Went to my son next, who's my youngest. He said, hey, Dad, that's great. In fact, he was my best man at our wedding went to my oldest daughter, who's probably more like me. She's an attorney in the state of Colorado. Went to her. She said, Dad, how can you do this? <laughs> and she just fell apart. And now she's the closest to my wife. But I knew that it was God, and I know how God leads. And I've used that sometimes to show, you know, I had just left the law practice I had walked away from it. I didn't sell it. I walked away from it to go into the ministry because I knew God was calling me. And we were at Andrews when my first wife's breast cancer was discerned. And we fought with that for eight years of my ministry. And you can say sometimes, well, why do these things happen? You know, I've just given my life over to the Lord, have walked away from the fairly successful law practice, and I'm... I'm doing this. But, you know, as I look back on it, I know that the Lord used that to guide me into where I am today. And for the, a greater love for him, a greater love for his message. 
And I know in the resurrection, I know my first wife is going to be there because of her, where she was spiritually. And she's going to be thrilled. She's going to be thrilled with my second wife as Stephen is going to be thrilled with Paul. If you think about it, there's going to be some exciting surprises in heaven. And I want to be there, and I hope all of you want to be there bad enough that you won't miss it. After, I, after we're getting ready or thinking about going out, leaving Hope, uh, I traveled with Ron three years at that point. We began to look for property. We went to North Carolina because I'd traveled all over the United States, and to me, North Car- Carolina was very a place that I really liked the mountains of North Carolina. My wife was, my new wife was from Kentucky. She was from the mountains there. And I was from Colorado, from the mountains there. North Carolina just really appealed. So we were looking, we were taken to one piece of property and it was kind of the side of a mountain, but it had springs and stuff on it. But right adjacent to it was a log cabin, old antique log cabin that was kind of neat, but it wasn't for sale. We didn't think so. I mean, it wasn't on the market as such. And we went over and we looked at this log cabin, and right above the doorway of the log cabin, carved into the log, was the date 1888. And you can imagine that appealed to our hearts at that point. And we asked the real estate man to check, and we found out that the fellow would sell it, and we ended up buying that and joining the two pieces of property, and that's where we live in North Carolina. But we called our property our high calling, because 1888 was such an important time in the Adventist church. As you've heard, I know, the, uh, it was going out, you know, the law, the law, the law, and Ellen White says it was like the hills of Geboa, because it was just the law without the Lord. And Wagner and Jones came along and they began to preach a message at the General Conference. And by that the way, that was in November. They, that ended in November of 1888. Our log cabin was built in December. They had December 11th, 1888. But they began to preach the message of righteousness by faith, the true message of righteousness by faith, brothers and sisters. And they were coming from the side of legalism into a understanding of Christ's work in our lives in order to give us the power to keep the law that had been talked about so much. Recently, at the general conference session, it was the first Sabbath general conference session, Clifford Goldstein was the speaker for Sabbath school, and he kind of shocked several of us that were sitting there listening by saying that when Paul or Saul at that point met Christ on the road to Damascus, Christ didn't come up and say, hey, Saul, I'm coming in the nature of Adam before or after the fall. In other words, he was saying, this is not really an important item, an important subject in our church. And it really hit me because it told me he hasn't, either he hasn't studied it or he doesn't understand it as he needs to understand it. I've got a letter composed to Clifford, a nice letter talking to him a little bit more about that. The other thing that happened at the general conference, I received this little book, Jesus, Human or Divine. It was handed out in the exhibit area. It was being handed out to everybody that went through. In the front of it, it says, the harmony of Christ's two distinct natures, the divine nature of God, the perfect human nature which Adam had before the fall. There's some other interesting things. I've started going through this. There's a lot of good quotes from Ellen White. And folks, we're going to find things that have great quotes from Ellen White. And if we aren't reading everything, we're going to be led astray. 
Because there's a couple of things in here. Because it's interesting. The quotes will go right along. They'll have the dark letters and the light letters. But at the same time, there'll be this lady's own words. And, and sometimes it starts off with a quote and then a comma and then her words. And I just want to read you a couple of things that uh, really hit me. I'm, I'm just into the first of the book. And I want to see how you'd react to some of these words. A careful study of the biblical concepts, this is her words, of omniscience and omnipresence will reveal that these two terms are in essence identical. Do you hear what she's saying? She's saying omniscience and omnipresence are identical. Is that true? And then listen to how she goes on after that. If any attributes of God are missing, meaning if one of these is missing, he would not be God. Now, what do we know about Jesus? He gave up his omnipresence, brothers and sisters, in order to come down here. He no longer can be present everywhere. And that should make us love him even more because this is a something for him to give that up. But she's saying he can still know what's happening everywhere through his omniscience, so he hasn't really given up his omnipresence. See, she's taking him down a step in a way. You see that? And so that alerted me, and, and there are other things in here, because she has some quotes that would give me the strong understanding that Christ came in the nature of Adam after the fall, but after a few of those quotes, here's another statement, and this starts out, when Christ assumed the liabilities of human nature to be proved and tried, and then has first selected messages 226 and a comma, now her words, part of Ellen White's sentence, comma, her words, he accepted 4,000 years of sin's deterioration upon his human structure, which is true, Along with the 40-day fast, he so lowered his perfect pre-fall human nature that it far outweighed the lowest weakness of any man's resistance to temptation. Therefore, he had no advantage over any man. She uses the words perfect pre-fall human nature. You won't find that in any of Ellen White's writings, brothers and sisters. There's nothing that talks about a perfect pre-fall human nature of Christ. And the reason I'm using this for an example, folks, is because we're at a time where we need to know what we believe. And we take a book like this, and you're going to be misled if you can't. I mean, these things stood right out at me when I, when I saw these. And somebody said, well, how can you go through and read this? Well, I can read it because there's a lot of good quotes in here. They're Ellen White's quotes. But it's been taken in a way that people reading this that don't understand that there's a lot of the quotes that have been left out. Because Ellen White, if you go through her writings, you'll find that she has quote, and I'm going to share a couple of these in a while. She has a quote after quote after quote that Christ came in the nature of fallen Adam. She doesn't have a single quote that says Christ came in the nature of of Adam before the fall. Not a single quote. But people are still out there arguing, and it almost, see, in, in a way, it, it fits in with this uh, statement that uh, Brother Gary read about the fact that the very last deception of Satan would be to make him none effect the testimony of the spirit of prophecy, because people begin to hear that, and they see the other quote, and they begin to say, Hey, Ellen White is speaking against herself. On one side, she's saying he came in the pre-fall nature. The other side, she's, he's, he came in the post-fall nature. So in a way, it starts to strike a consciousness. And I'll tell you, folks, when I came into this church, I was well aware of Joseph Smith, Mary Baker Eddy, because I'd been into the New Age movement. I knew these, the background on these people, and I knew that they were not from God.
And so when I heard about a prophet in the Seventh-day Adventist church, I had to check it out. And folks, there's not a single question in my mind today that Ellen White was a prophet of God, is a prophet of God, and that her messages are so important. In fact, if we pay attention to her messages, we're still told that we'll avoid the delusions that will be brought upon this church in the last days and see, folks, we aren't avoiding those as a church. I don't know whether you know we have a medical uh, hospital in Colorado that's being sued now, big time, by the people that sued the tobacco companies. The same hospital has a joint Catholic Adventist board. I, I know that hospital very well because I started out in the ministry as an intern in Denver at and Porter Hospital was one of the hospitals I sat on their board. There's things happening, folks, that make you weep between the porch and the altar. Now, I know in my own heart, and I know from my studies, that the church is not going to become Babylon. And I've said that before. I had a fellow get so upset with me because I said that. But the church is not going to be Babylon. But at the same time, I don't believe the structure as it now exists is going to go through. Amen. We've been told the church is a movement. You know, a lot of times we think in terms of the church as the leadership. We're the church. We're the church. You are the church. And there is going to be a movement that will go all the way through. If you think about it, the structure couldn't really exist in the time of Sunday laws because you can't have a Seventh-day Adventist church structure call the Seventh-day Adventist church structure that's sitting there when it says it's illegal to keep the Sabbath rather than Sunday. You see what I'm saying? And that's why it's going to be a grassroots type movement. And if you've see, heard of the Loma Linda vision, which they say is an apocryphal vision, but it's backed by people that were pretty well known. Mrs. McIntyre, who is one of her uh, writers, Pastor Robinson, who was a, a well-known pastor at that point, she was at the Loma Linda railroad station, and she's having. A, she starts to have a vision, and as she tells him about the vision, she's looking out and she sees the Adventist church, the structure, and she says as she watched, the structure totally disappeared, and you can imagine what that did to her. But as she continued to watch, she saw. A group pull up, rise up over here. Another group rise up over here. Another group rise up over here. Folks, the church has some really good people in it. We want to remember that. We have some that believe the message wholeheartedly but don't stand up for it either. And see, that's a problem too. If you ever have a chance, if you have a computer, look up the curse of Meraz, M-E-O-R-Z. If you haven't heard of that, that was a curse that Deborah put on certain of the Jewish tribes back when the Deborah and, uh, had, had gone up against the Canaanites, had defeated them. And after the defeat, there were certain tribes from the area of Meraz that had failed to take a stand one way or the other. They hadn't stood against the Hebrews. They hadn't stood to help them. And Deborah placed a curse on that group because they failed to come up to the help of the Lord. And Ellen White has several statements about those that take a neutral stance in the time of controversy. If you look under the curse of Meraz, look under Meraz, you'll find that Ellen White's got statement after statement saying that it's worse to stay neutral than it is to be an apostate. Look that up. Look at it. I'd like to have you look at a scripture, 1 Peter 3.15, if you'd turn there. 1 Peter 1 Peter 3.15, the Bible says, 
but sanctify the Lord God, where? In your hearts and be what? Ready, how often? Always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. It kind of makes me think about what uh, Brother Gary said about people that were called the people of the book. We were once called the people of the book. You won't hear that out there very often anymore, folks. Do you see what he's saying? He's saying we need to know our message. Now, when we have folks that say it's not important how you believe about the pre-fall or the post-fall nature of Christ, I think they're attacking the 1888 message from the opposite end. Because if you go back, and I'm going to share some things with you that, that will back up what I'm going to say. You go back, you find that Jones and Wagner understood the nature of Christ. And the interesting thing, they, they didn't preach a lot about it. They did preach about it, but they didn't emphasize it because so did all the rest of our church. It wasn't a questionable thing. The question at their time was the law, the law, the law. But if you think about it, part of righteousness by faith is the ability to overcome sin in our lives, and the ability to overcome sin in our lives relates directly back to whether Christ was our example or not our example. Not just our substitute, but our example. And so they spoke on this issue, as did many others. Now, just to... I want to share with you, I don't know whether you've looked at Bible readings for the home circle back before the new theology started to come into our church in 1950. I'm going to read to you what, what it says. I've got the 1914, the 1920, and 1944 editions of this book at my home, and I checked it. They're, they're the same, same statement, every one. You'll find it at page 174. Now listen to this. In his humanity, Christ partook of our sinful, fallen nature. If not, then he was not made like unto his brethren, was not in all points tempted like as we are, did not overcome as we have to overcome, and is not therefore the complete and perfect Savior man needs and must have to be saved. The idea that Christ was born of an immaculate or sinless mother, inherited no tendencies to sin, and for this reason did not sin, removes him from the realm of a fallen world and from the very place where help is needed. On his human side, Christ inherited just what every child of Adam inherits, a sinful nature. Now, not a sinning, and that's where people get mixed up. It's not a sinning because Christ never sinned. It says a sinful nature, which is the tendency, but he had the Holy Spirit that always checked any temptations like, like in, when he had the three temptations. The Holy Spirit was with him. The Holy Spirit was with him from conception. But listen, every child of Adam inherits a sinful nature. On the divine side, from his very conception, he was begotten and born of the Spirit from the very conception. And all this was done to place mankind on vantage ground and to demonstrate in the same way everyone who is born of the Spirit may gain like victories over sin in his own sinful flesh. Thus, each one is to overcome as Christ overcame. Without this birth, there can be no victory over temptation and no salvation from sin. Do you see why, Jesus, or why Satan wants to waylay us on this? Do you know even our 27 fundamental doctrines don't make this clear? If you go in, you'll find out that you can take either side. Because politically, our church doesn't want to have any shaking of the boats, people disagreeing. You know, that's, that's what really bothers me. We have leaders that believe the right thing, but politically take certain stands, folks. We need to pray for our leaders because we do have some that have the right understanding. I want to read a statement by Kenneth Wood. Do you, any of you know who Kenneth Wood was? 
before Johnson, before Bill Johnson became the editor of the Review, Kenneth Wood was the editor. Back at that point in time, Ron Spear worked under Kenneth Wood as a field representative for the Review and Herald, and he was very happy with Kenneth Wood. He and Kenneth would talk about these things that were going on in the church. And Ron Spear knew that Bill Johnson was coming in, was going to take over as editor of the Review, and he went to Ken, and he said, Ken, he says, I'm leaving. He said, I know where Bill Johnson will take this magazine. And that's when Ron went out and started a ministry. Now, Ron's been an evangelist in this church. He was a missionary in this church. He was a singing evangelist for a while, folks. I don't know whether you realize that, but he's an evangelist up in, in uh, Canada. He actually debated Desmond Ford up there when Desmond, before they defrocked Desmond Ford because other people were praising Desmond Ford because they hadn't studied enough to realize where the subtle differences were. And Ron knew the spirit of prophecy, and he could see that Desmond Ford was conflicting with the spirit of prophecy. Anyhow, Ron left. Now, Kenneth Wood had retired. This, And I'm going to tell you where this can be found here in a minute. He's the former editor of the Review before Bill Johnson. He's part of the, he was part of the White Estate Board of Trustees. Here's what he says. It is my deep conviction that before the church can proclaim with power God's last warning message to the world, it must be united on the truth about Christ's human nature. Now, Kenneth Wood is a sharp man. The problem again is, folks that he hasn't stood up. In fact, he got upset with Ron because of what Ron did as far as leaving and, and going out and, and uh, seeking to bring the truth to God's people. You know, we have the story of Andreasen, too. Andreasen was a fantastic man that went out and saw the things that were happening in the church and coming in, and he sought to warn the church. Do you know they took away his credentials for a while? I mean, he was an old man. He was on substantation, and they took away his substantation for a while. Later, they apologized for that. Now, the people that started changing things also said that we have a group, because they were, they, you know why this all happened, I think. They wanted to please the Protestant world, because the Protestant world, who believes in original sin, See, if you believe in original sin, folks, you can't believe that Christ came in the nature of Adam before the fall. I mean, after the fall. Because original sin means that you're already a sinner. You don't have a choice. It's not a choice. It's there. That was Augustine. So people that have that understanding can't accept. So these are... are Leaders from our church were dealing with these people, and, and these people are saying, well, you know, you've got to remain a sect as far as our cult, whatever you want to call it, as far as we're concerned, because you have this belief. Oh, we don't really believe that. Our prophet doesn't really say that. We don't believe that. Only a few fanatics, right-wing, I can't even remember uh, the exact terminology, but it's something like right-wing fanatics believe that sort of thing. And that's when the theology started to change. And it was with people that we have thought highly of. Yeah. And so over the years, it's come out to finally where you don't discuss this anymore. But folks, if it's part of the 1888 message, we better have the right understanding of it. And I wanna, I'm going to give you some background here in a little bit to show you how. It's part of that message. But I want to give you a little bit more other background. If we think of sin as part of our nature, that's original sin. But if we think in terms of sin as a choice, it's no longer original sin. We have the choice. It's not automatically placed upon us. Adam, even though he sinned, and I want to give you some stuff to, or some scripture to show some of these things. If you turn to 1 John chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3. And we know this definition, and we should know it. We should have it memorized, folks. 
This is an important enough subject, folks, that we need to understand it fully. We need to have, know how to talk to somebody about it. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, is our definition of sin. Whosoever committeth sin does what? Transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Transgression is an active verse, folks, a verb. In other words, it's a verb where you have action. You have to have something happening. You have to violate the law. You have to transgress in order to have sin. Now, sin takes knowledge. And I want to look at that just a little bit. If you turn with me to James chapter 4, James chapter 4. We're going to look at verse 17, James chapter 4, verse 17. The Bible says, therefore to him that what? Knoweth. That's a very important word. You might want to circle that in your Bible. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Do you see how clearly it takes knowledge? To him that knoweth to do good and doesn't do it, to him it's sin. So sin takes knowledge. You have to have knowledge. It's not automatic. See, if it was automatic, it wouldn't take any knowledge. You're already a sinner. That's what Augustine... And, uh, you know, I've done a sermon, not here. I just did a couple of weeks ago on Augustine. And if any of you know his background and, and his desires and the lusts that he fought with and the women that he stayed with, you'd understand why he finally came around to this understanding of sin. It wasn't his fault. It was something that was placed there. He had no choice over. Turn to Romans 7, if you would, and I'm hoping you're keeping these scriptures because folks we need to know these I'm going to look at verses 7 to 9 Romans 7 7 to 9 the Bible says what shall we say then is the law sin God forbid nay I had not known sin but by the law again we're talking about knowledge for I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. Without, for without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. In other words, when he began to understand sin, he suffered the consequences of sin. He died. Okay? So knowledge, again. But here's another thing that we've got to be careful of. And that is that we don't say, well, hey, if I don't know about it, I won't be a sinner. So keep me out in the woods. Keep me away from any knowledge. Keep me away from any understanding. Because that way I can avoid being a sinner. I can do it, and if I don't know it's sin, then I'm not guilty of it. Well, turn with me. Well, let me read a statement, then I'm going to show you some scripture. This is found in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 55. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 55. It says, In the judgment, men will not be condemned because they conscientiously believed a lie, but because they did not believe the truth because they neglected the opportunity of learning what is truth. Do you hear what that says? In other words, we can't avoid trying to learn about truth. It's interesting, a few years ago I had a uh, Daniel seminar at our church in North Carolina. We had one person show up for one day, and I, you can imagine how discouraged I was. We, but, I mean, one outside person. We had all, our church was there supporting it, but we just didn't, People just didn't come. And I was ready to just cut off the seminar. And this one lady in the church said to me, she said, Brother Floyd, the fact is that the seminar is happening and that it is available to this community. And in the judgment, 
When somebody goes and says to God that's from this community, hey, I never had a chance to learn these things, God can say, hey, remember that seminar that you kept being inspired to go to by the Holy Spirit and you chose not to go to? You chose not to know these things. You chose to be ignorant. That's been a real help to me, and I hope it's a help to you folks, because sometimes we can go be out, we can go door to door, we can talk to people, and it seems like they're all turning from us, closing the doors on us. But see, that's the importance of us not being the one that's responsible to bring these souls in. If we really realize the importance of the Holy Spirit, that's why Satan attacks the Holy Spirit so much now, too. If we really realize the importance of the Holy Spirit, we'll understand that that's the Holy Spirit's job. Our job is to bring truth to people. And it's the Holy Spirit's job to put that truth into their hearts. Now, he doesn't force it, but he moves on their minds and on their hearts, and their heart represents the mind, to think about these things, to look at them. And somebody may deny it at one point and pick it up at another point. But I'll tell you, that has helped me so much because used to, you, 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 you want to be the one that convinces these people, but you aren't the convincer. You're the sharer and the Holy Spirit's the convincer. Hopefully that will, will help you. Turn with me to John 15. I want to give you, be sure and give you scripture. John 15, we're going to look at verses 22 and 24. John 15, verses 22 and 24. The Bible says, Jesus speaking, if I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had what? Sin. But now they have no cloak for their sin. 24. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my Father. Do you see the knowledge required again? Jesus brought the message. They didn't listen to the message. And so they were guilty of not following that message. If you turn to John chapter 9, verse 41, John chapter 9, and there's other verses I could give you, but we only have, you know, so many hours, so much time. Not John chapter 9, verse 41 Jesus again speaking, it says, the Bible says, Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say, We see, therefore your sin remaineth. Do you see what that's saying again, brothers? So again, brothers and sisters, it's... And the real corker, you know, I was reading the, you know, Pope Benedict, what is it, 15, 16? 16 had spoken about Augustine. And, of course, all our news magazines have been carrying everything about the popes and the front page pictures and everything. But I noticed an interesting letter in one, you know, letters to the editors. And I, I look through those sometimes just to see how people out in the world are responding to that. And Pope uh, Benedict XVI had said something about Augustine and, uh, and about original sin. And there was this letter and a quoted a scripture. And I want you to look at that, Ezekiel 18, if you would. Ezekiel 18. Now, he just quoted one of these verses. I'm going to give you two. Verse 2 says in the Bible, What mean ye that you use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Do you see what that's saying? The children are suffering from what the father did. They didn't eat the sour grapes. That's the proverb. Now notice what it says. As I live, saith the Lord God, you shall not have occasion any more to use this proverb in Israel. In other words, it's not an accurate proverb. It was one you guys made up. Verse 4. Behold, all souls are mine, as the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. And then you go down to verse 20. 
It repeats it. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. And that was quoted in the paper as saying, why do they even talk about original sin? The Bible is very clear that we are not guilty for this. You know, we are not partakers of the sin of, sins of our father. Now, what we are, we're partakers of the genetics. So we have the same weaknesses that our parents had. And I've seen that in my own life. I, my father, I can remember when, as a child, he'd have all-night poker games in our house. And I have a weakness towards gambling if I go that direction, and so I have to stay away, totally away from any sort of gambling, which I should anyhow. So that doesn't bother, but it shows that I have a weakness in that area, and I, and I think I can trace it back to my father. And I'm sure each of you can look back to your parents. Both my parents smoked. I smoked for a while. We do have weaknesses that will show up. But that's not sin. A weakness is not sin. And if you look at the inheritance of Jesus, he had a prostitute in his background. He had murderers in his background. But he never sinned because he had the Holy Spirit with him. And that's the encouragement that each of us have is that God is willing, if we'll surrender to him, to give us the Holy Spirit. That every one of us can have victory in our lives. In fact, he's looking for that. He's looking for a people, folks, that will come perfectly reproduce his character in their lives. You know, Christ Object Lesson 69. When we perfectly reproduce God's character in our lives, he will come to take us home. God's looking for a people to perfectly reproduce his character. Quote from Ellen White, First Testimonies, page 116. If light come and that light is set aside or rejected, then comes condemnation and the frown of God. But before the light comes, there is no sin, for there is no light for them to reject. Again, in... Uh, Councils on Health, page 81, there's an interesting little thing in there. It says that Ellen White notes that using tobacco injures the body. But God is merciful those, to those who use it in ignorance. Only after light comes are they guilty. But that's not where it stops. But they will suffer the consequences. That's the difference between evil and guilt. They'll suffer the consequences. None will be, 5 B.C., 1145, none will be condemned for not heeding light and knowledge that they never had. But see, that doesn't protect, you know, we can, even though we don't realize it's sin, all our coffee drinkers in the world are suffering the consequences, folks. And most of them would not even begin to think that's a sin. And it's not to those that don't realize what it's doing to their bodies. Anything, any injury we give to our body is a sin, folks. God has given us so much information. I want to give you some scriptures that in my mind, I was talking to a young fellow that had gone to Heartland and then he'd gone to our seminary and I said, well, what, what did they teach you at the seminary in regard to the nature of Christ? And he said, well, they taught me that uh, Jesus came in the nature of Adam before the fall. It's our seminary. That's why a lot of our pastors are getting that. And I said, well, how did they handle Hebrews, the second chapter, verses 16 or 14 through 18? He said, oh, we didn't do that one. We didn't discuss that. Well, I want to give you some, some things to look at. I'm going to start out with Philippians, the second chapter. If you turn to Philippians chapter 2, and these are chapters and places that you should be aware of yourselves, folks. So hopefully you're going to take these down and remember where they are, go back, look at them, make sure that what I'm reading you is what is there. 
because the noble Bereans were more noble than the Thessalonians because they searched daily to make sure that what was told to them was true. Lee Forbes, who's going to be here tonight, is uh, he and I had a radio program in Nashville for a year. I'll tell you, or for two years. The Lord has so many ways. You know, I walked away from the law practice, didn't sell it or anything, but the Lord has always taken care of me. And uh, I've shared with others, and others have shared with me just how the Lord has worked. This radio program that we were looking for ended up coming to us, and we didn't have to pay a thing for it. And it was on what we called the golden hour. It was from 8 to 9 on Sunday mornings, right when everybody's getting, getting ready and going to church, Sunday church. And we called it Bible Answers with Clark and Lee. But we used Acts 17.11 that the Thessalonians, or the Bereans were more noble than the Thessalonians because they searched daily to make sure that what Paul was saying was true. Because we said, hey, folks out there that are listening, you need to search and check everything we tell you. In fact, Lee, if he were here, he'd tell you the story about talking to the manager of the station who was Presbyterian that went to his church, the Presbyterian church. And the guys there said to him, he said, have you heard what uh, these guys are sharing on your radio program? He said, yeah. He said, well, uh, how can you allow that? And the manager said to him, uh, have you called them to challenge them? And the one guy said to the manager, he says, they use the Bible. <laughs> and that's what we did, folks. It's the Bible. I mean, it's not what I can say. It's not what Daryl can say. It's not what Gary can say. It's what the Bible says. And that's where we need to be coming from. We need to be people of the Bible again. Philippians 2, verses 5 to 8 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of of man. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. You know, when I read these verses, folks, my heart is one even deeper to Jesus. But because for him to take my sinful nature, for him to come here, to take my nature tells me how great he loves me. Doesn't that tell you how great he loves each of you? And he was doing it to give you an example to show that we can overcome sin in each of our lives. If you turn to Romans 8.3, it's not just one scripture that we have to make this argument. And of course out there they'll say, well, likeness doesn't really mean the same. For what the law, Romans 8, 3, the Bible says, For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Hebrews. I've got to move a little bit here because I know my time is... <laughs> you know, Harvey and I have been together for... Since 1990, Harvey's been at Hope longer than I have. I came there in 1990. And so, so many meetings, you know, Harvey will hold up the sign how much time is left. Well, when I was at Hope, my wife happened to be on, we didn't have a sign, we had a little red light up front. And I was preaching, and when the red light goes, means you're through. <laughs> and my wife got messed up on the time. And she began flashing the red light up here. The light's flashing, and I know how much time I have, and I had several minutes left. And finally, I had to say, I had to interrupt my sermon, and I had to say, hey, Mary, check your time again. <laughs> but we, we want to be on time. We don't want to run into other time, and, and we, well, we still want to get in what we can. 
Okay, Hebrews chapter 2, and this one I think is, if you understand the book of Hebrews, the first chapter talks about the divinity of Christ, the second chapter talks about the humanity of Christ. If you go down to verse 14, it says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the what? The same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham, not the seed of Adam before the fall. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is also able to succor them that are tempted. Now, you might write down these other scriptures, Hebrews 4.15, we aren't going to look at it. 1 John 4, verses 1 to 3. And I want to read to you. quote, this is from Three Selected Messages. By the way, the book First Selected Messages, if you read from page, I think it's 242, it's around in there, to 289, you're going to find a lot of Ellen White's theology in regard to the nature of Christ. It's a beautiful section. It's worth reading. First Selected Messages, 242, 289. But this is in Three Selected Messages, 132. It says, she says, he assumed human nature with its infirmities, its liabilities, its temptations. He exercised in his own behalf no power which man cannot exercise. As man he met temptation and overcame in the strength given him of God. He gives us an example of perfect obedience. One other one quick on, from the great work of redemption. This review and herald. February 24th, 1874. The great work of redemption could be carried out only by the Redeemer taking the place of fallen Adam. Isn't that pretty clear? He, Jesus, would take man's fallen nature and engage to cope with a strong foe who triumphed over Adam. He would overcome Satan and in thus doing, he would open the way for the redemption of those who would believe in him from the disgrace, on him from the disgrace of Adam's failure and fall. Now I've got quote after quote after quote that I could give you. But you know, one of the arguments that they finally came up with was the argument that the Baker letter, I think many of you probably have heard of the Baker letter. Now you need to remember that this letter was not written to the church at large in the first place. It's written to an individual pastor that's in Tasmania. And apparently he's got some kind of problem, but she doesn't say what kind of problem he has. Now it's interesting, I want to just give you a quote here of what she says about unpublished, because this wasn't written to the church at large. It wasn't a published letter. You know, they've become, become published through the White Estate, but not at her time. 5T696 says, And now to all who have a desire for truth, I would say, do not give credence to unauthenticated reports as to what Sister White has done or said or written. If you desire to know what the Lord has revealed through her, read her published works. And that makes sense. Some things have, and, and I, and I want to say that in that Baker letter, by the way, she doesn't say that Christ came in the nature of uh, Adam before the fall. You'd almost think she said that because of the way they used. What she does say is don't make Christ altogether too human. Now, Ralph Larson in The Word Made Flesh, if any of you read that, has an interesting observation on the Baker letter. And it's one that's worth reading because it really, it really, was, it sounded correct to me. He said, back in the time of Baker, one of the problems that existed back then that doesn't exist today is the theory of adoptionism. And what that theory was, brothers and sisters, was that Christ came in human nature altogether. And at the cross, either at the crucifixion or the resurrection, he was adopted by God. Now, do you begin to understand that if that was Baker's problem, why she would say, don't make Christ altogether too human? 
See, they have taken that letter and, and have added assumptions to that letter to try to bring it around to their way of thinking. But how can you contradict her very clear statements that Christ came in the nature of Adam after the fall? And if you are, see, a lot of our people, by the way, brothers and sisters, have got their PhDs from the world. And most of your worldly schools will teach original sin. You know, the interesting thing is that there are several theologians that are out in the Protestant world now, and I'll give you their names, Karl Barth, Emil Bruner, Rudolf Boltman, Oscar Kuhlman, J.A.T. Robinson, and others have openly declared themselves in support of a human nature affected by the fall. The Protestant world's coming our way, and we're going their way. Our pioneers, our prophet. And what it does, it tells me again how our prophet is a prophet. She's called by God. She is God's speaker. Now, you know, at the 1888 conference, that was not recorded at general conference. The sessions were not recorded. But soon after, Wagner and Jones both spoke or wrote that ended November 4, 1888. E.J. Wagner, who lived, from, by the way, from 1855 to 1960, wrote some articles beginning in 1889, and here's one of his statements. I mean, there, I could pull out, I just, there's just not enough time to read you all his statements. By the way, Prescott was another one that backed the correct nature of Christ. All, all the pioneers all did that, that I can find. It says, a little thought will be sufficient to show anybody that if Christ took upon himself the likeness of man in order that he might redeem man, it must have been sinful man that he was made like, for it was sinful man that he came to redeem. That makes sense, doesn't it? That's Wagner. Jones. He lived from, by the way, he lived from on both sides of Wagner. Remember, Wagner lived 1855-1916. Jones lived from 1850 to 1923. By the way, Prescott lived from 1855 to 1944. Here's Jones. Jesus Christ came in just such flesh as ours, but with a mind that held its integrity against every temptation, against every inducement to sin, a mind that never consented to sin, no, never, in the least conceivable shadow of a thought. Do you see there's a difference between the mind and the flesh? He could come in our flesh but he had a mind controlled by the Holy Spirit. And he's made it possible for every one of us here to have a mind controlled by the Holy Spirit so that we can resist the temptations that we have in the flesh. I could read another one from Prescott. I'm down to five minutes. And so I want to share another statement here quickly. This is found in your great controversy book, 425. It says, those who are living upon the earth when the intercession of Christ shall cease in the sanctuary above are, stand, are to stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator, intercessor, same thing. You know, people have said, how could you ever be an attorney? I said, hey, Jesus was an attorney. They call him a mediator, an intercessor. I said, uh, <laughs> he was. He's our attorney in the investigative judgment. Their robes must be spotless. Their characters must be purified by, from sin by the blood of sprinkling. Through the grace of God and their own diligent effort, they must be conquerors in the battle with evil. God is so good. And one of the reasons for these camp meetings, brothers and sisters, is not to come here and entertain you. We aren't in the entertainment business, folks. We're here because we're concerned for your souls. And we want you to know truth because it saddens our hearts when we see that truth is not being presented to God's people. And we get more and more people over uh, 2,500 a day, I think it is, coming into the church. And they aren't being given the full message, so it keeps getting watered down more and more. A book I picked up, I think I told, well, I read some of that. The book from the General Conference. I want to quickly, in closing, tell you about a book that if you haven't read it, we have it here in our bookstore. It's the best book you'll ever find on the history 
in regard to the nature of Christ. It's called Touched With Our Feelings. It's by J.R. Zercher. And this man was the head of the BRI, the Biblical Research Institute in Afro-Asia. This book is published by the Review and Herald. At the general conference session, I went in the bookstore looking for this book. And if I couldn't find it, I asked the lady, I said, do you have the book? Because I just wanted to see whether they were even pushing it, selling it. And she said, oh, we have that. And she said, it must be out here somewhere. And she couldn't find it. She finally went back and found it in a box. Folks, if you want to know what Wagner, what Jones said, if you want to know what Ellen White writes, if you want to know the whole history background of how this all came about, how the new theology came into the church, the people involved, if you want to know what Bill Johnson believes, if, I'll tell you, it's in this book, quotes. This is the best book, and you won't see it mentioned hardly anywhere. Touched with our feelings, written by the head of the BRI. It's in our bookstore here. Get this book, folks. I've read through it twice. I've just been thrilled with the information. That quote I gave you from Kenneth Wood. Kenneth Wood wrote the foreword, or the preface to this book. He talks about being raised as a little boy with the understand, correct understanding of the nature of Christ all up through his life. He knew, his mother said, Jesus came even as a baby to show you that even as a child, you can have victory in your life. Folks, it's our concern, our desire that you spend the time to again restore to our people the title of the people of the book. Can we kneel for prayer? Our most gracious Heavenly Father, oh, how patient you are with us, Lord. How much you must love each of us. How patient you've been with our church, our beloved church. Lord, I know many of us came into this church with rose-colored glasses on. And how disappointed we've been to see some of the happenings in our church and, and the fact that some of our leaders won't stand or, or stand for the wrong thing. Lord, help us to be your people. Help us to study your word. Help us to know what you would have us to do. Lord, in Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, Jesus promises that he'll circumcise our hearts and the heart of our seed to love him with all our heart and soul. And we pray for that, Lord, because we know that none of us love, love him as much as we want to love him. And even that, we need help. So I'd ask that you be with each of my brothers and sisters here, that you work in their hearts, that you will draw them closer and closer to you, that they will make that commitment to study and to know these things, to understand, but most of all, to know you as their Lord and Savior, because without you, we can have a lot of information and yet be outside of heaven. Help us is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.